Let's play a game. Which of these shapes is Boba and which one is Kiki? What about these two? And what about this? If you are not familiar with the Boba Kiki effect, it was first described by psychologist Wolfgang Keller, uh, one of the main contributors to Gestalt psychology, back in 1929. It attempts to demonstrate that people may not attach sounds to shapes arbitrarily. There is a solid consistency in the way in which we humans connect meaning to abstract shapes, sounds and words. It reckons that there is an underlying shared sentiment to the suggestive qualities of things. The effect has been replicated on several occasions among populations of different cultures, languages and even in small children. For a vast majority, boba is curvy and soft. Kiki is angular and spiky. But it goes even further. Individuals pair boba with positive qualities and Kiki with negative ones. Boba is welcoming and cozy. Kiki is hostile and jarring. Leaving out speculations about the influence of orthographic forms of the words and letters, etc., there's no great mystery to how this phenomenon functions. And it boils down to onomatopoeic qualities. To pronounce boba, you need to place your mouth in a round shape and make use of long vowels. Whereas for Kiki, you have to repeat a short syllable of sharp sounds. If anything, it demonstrates that there's a limit to the synesthetic capacities of spoken and written language. It shows that there are very specific instances in which words and shapes clearly resonate with each other, overlapping in several attributes. But what's the shape of words like, I don't know, boli or mape or whatever? Bob and Kiki become mild mental viruses. I've been exploring the world through their lens for some time now, wondering about the boba kikiness of all things I come across. The other day I went to an exhibition by my good friend Fabian Bergmark Nesman, and I told him that I couldn't really tell if his sculpture was boba or kiki. A boba silhouette with kiki eruptions, if anything. <laughs> As Benkat said when she posting about the loss of boba kikiology, Every real thing is in pure boba or in pure kiki, with seed of the opposite, as in Jing Jang, but boba kikier. When confronted with Fabian's sculpture, I crashed against the limiting binaries of our linguistic taxonomies. Art helps us rediscover what verbal language had previously obscured. The sculpture hung there, looking back at me, poking at boba and kiki as basic units of description. The hypothesis of the boba kiki effect attempts to prove that we don't create words and assign sounds and meanings at random, but what it certainly hints at is that language flattens our world, making it feel more mundane and monochrome, that words offer a very limiting vocabulary to the richness of direct experience. Some experiments try to map the associations of flavors to boba and kiki. Crisps are less boba than cream cheese. Carbonated water is more kiki than still water. But even in these highly sensorial examples, the conditions were a consequence of visual conditioning. Brands of carbonated drinks often feature angular motifs. Trying to describe the taste of chocolate with precision is a futile exercise. Placing it in the boba kiki axis just seems a little bit easier. If one is lucky enough, poetry slash art has the capacity to undo this desensitization. Poetry happens when language questions the limits of language. Poetry happens when these limits are surpassed by an excess of meaning, a meaning that limited language is unable to express. If a sculpture has enough thorns or slopes, if a song plays the right quotes, they can drip through the bias that elevates words and language as the fundamental expression of external reality. Shapes can tell more about shapes than words. Shapes can tell more about words than words themselves can. A shape is worth a thousand words. And I'll give you a couple. Boba and Kiki.